A great thing about anatomy is that as you learn more about it, you can start applying it everywhere. Whether it's suddenly being able to identify muscles, realising that there's something very wrong with this picture, or even figuring out why some people spit when they yawn. That said, there can be some downsides. For example, meditation has been ruined, but if as soon as someone says clear your mind and focus on your breathing, I'd just start thinking about anatomy again. It might be movement for the ribcage, innovation to the diaphragm, or perhaps I'll ponder the subject of today's video, the pleural membranes. Now you may not have heard of these membranes, or perhaps you have and you've just forgotten about them, but they play an absolutely vital role in breathing. In this video I want to look at what they do, how they do it, and why you need to know about them. So, in this drawing we've got a coronal view of the chest, with the ribcage on the outside, the diaphragm below, and the mediastinum running through the centre. We've also got the airway, dividing into two bronchi, and then heading up to the mouth and nose. If we start with the lungs, we can add them to the spaces on either side of the mediastinum, known as the pleural cavities. As you draw these, make sure to leave some space around them, and you'll also want to make sure they connect to the bronchi to form that central region of the lung, known as the hilum. The pleural membrane lies in this space between the lungs and the pleural cavity, and are composed of two layers. Parietal pleura lines the internal surface of the chest, and can be divided into different regions depending on what it covers. So, lining the ribs we have costal pleura, the diaphragmatic pleura covers the diaphragm, cervical pleura extends up into the neck, and then the mediastinum is covered with mediastinal pleura. The other layer covers the lung itself, and this is the visceral pleura. Now, although we talk about visceral and parietal as being separate layers, they're actually continuous with one another. So, as the visceral pleura reaches the hilum of the lung, it folds back on itself to become parietal. If you're struggling to visualise this, I've always told to think of the lungs sitting inside the membrane like a fist pushed into a balloon. Now, I actually tried this, and it didn't go so well, but a half-inflated exercise ball seemed to do the trick. So, if my fist is the lung, the areas in contact with it will be visceral pleura, which then folds back in every direction to form the parietal pleura. The folding of the membrane creates a space between the layers, known as the intrapleural space. Normally this just contains a small amount of fluid, but don't let that fool you into thinking that it's not important. First, that fluid will lubricate the two layers, allowing them to glide past each other as the lungs move inside the chest. The fluid in the intrapleural space also helps to resolve a problem. If you take a lung out of the body, then elastic fibres in the lung tissue will cause it to shrink down and deflate. However, when the lungs are in situ, we want them to almost completely fill those pleural cavities. So how do we stop them from deflating? Well, it's all to do with the surface tension of the intrapleural fluid. Now, at this point, I'd love to provide a beautifully simple and comprehensive description of how surface tension works, but I'm afraid I got three lines into the Wikipedia page and then went cross-eyed. All you need to know is the surface tension is a force created by this liquid that helps hold the parietal and visceral layers together. Since those layers attach to the chest wall and the surface of the lung respectively, the surface tension essentially allows the lungs to be held against the body wall, keeping them expanded. Of course you may be wondering, why is it so important to keep our lungs expanded? Surely the air coming into them would keep them inflated anyway. Well, to answer that, we need to look at the mechanism of breathing. But first, I need to talk about pressure. When it comes to the function of the lungs, there are some principles of pressure that are really worth getting your head round. Now, if you're a physics fan who knows that Pascal from their bars, please feel free to skip ahead to the next chapter. But if you think you to do with a pressure refresher, stick around and I'll do my best to explain it like a barometric Brian Cox. Pressure is essentially a measure of how many molecules are in a space, and how much room each of those molecules have to move. 
these molecules could be anything? But for this, let's say we've got a mixture of nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide, also known as air. So long as the ratio of molecules to space stays the same, the pressure should too. Changing the ratio will affect the pressure. For example, if you pack more molecules into a space, the pressure goes up. Alternatively, you could increase the pressure by keeping the same number of molecules, but making the space smaller. To decrease the pressure, you'd need to do the opposite. Either remove molecules from a space, or increase its size and give those molecules more room. Finally, if there's one thing that pressure hates, it's inequality. So if an area of higher pressure meets an area of lower pressure, molecules will try to move from high to low until those two pressures have equalised. So how does all of this relate to breathing? Well, let's go back to our original illustration. In this picture, the chest is at rest, the ribcage is lowered, and the diaphragm is relaxed, with the abdominal content pushing it up into this dome shape. At this point, there isn't much space inside the pleural cavity, and by extension, there won't be much space inside the lungs. Most importantly, the pressure inside the lungs is roughly the same as the pressure outside of the body. This means there'll be no real movement of air between these areas. When we breathe in, this all changes. The ribs move up and out, the diaphragm contracts and pushes downwards, and this space becomes a lot larger. As the body wall and diaphragm move outwards, the parietal pleura goes with them. The surface tension between the pleural layers will pull the visceral pleura out too, which in turn causes the lungs to expand. Opening up the lungs increases the amount of space inside of them, but not the amount of air. Therefore, the pressure inside the lungs will decrease. This causes an imbalance, as relatively speaking, the air pressure outside of the body is now higher than the pressure inside the lungs. Remember those pressures will want to equalise, meaning molecules will move from high to low, and air rushes into the lungs via the nose or mouth. During expiration, this process is reversed. The diaphragm and chest wall return to their original positions, reducing the space inside the chest. This increases the pressure inside the lungs and forces air to be expelled via the nose and mouth. A common misconception is to think of the lungs as being like balloons. It's fair enough, they both contain elastic, they can both be pink, and they generally work best when filled with air. However, we've just seen one major difference. Balloons are inflated by having air pushed into them. Lungs work the other way round, needing to be expanded first so that air can be pulled into them. Understanding the role of the pleural membranes is also really important clinically. For example, inflammation of the pleural layers can result in them becoming roughened or adhesive, once this happens, movement for the lungs inside the chest can become limited and painful. We can also end up with unwanted liquids or gases entering the intrapleural cavity. These conditions are usually called something thorax. So if blood enters the space, we'd call it a hemothorax. But if air was in the space, you'd have a pneumothorax. Pneumothoraces can occur in several ways but they'll all involve damage to the pleural membrane. For example, if a weak spot in the wall of the lung ruptures, it might tear an opening in the visceral pleura. As the patient breathes in, the drop in pressure won't just pour air into the lung, but also through the lung and into this space. As air enters the space, it can work its way between the pleural layers, breaking the surface tension that holds them together. Once this happens, the elasticity of the lung can cause it to deflate, leaving the patient with a collapsed lung. Now, while this isn't great, it could be worse. In this situation, air can still pass back through the opening when the patient breathes out. 
so although the lung will stay collapsed, the pressure around it should stay fairly constant. That won't be the case if they suffer something known as a tension pneumothorax. This is almost identical to a regular pneumothorax, but with one important difference. The damage to the pleural membrane creates a flap, and this flap will act like a valve. As the patient breathes in, the flap opens, allowing air to rush into the space as before. However, when they try to exhale, the flap closes, trapping the extra air in the pleural cavity. This process repeats with each breath, resulting in more and more air entering the chest. The more air in that space, the higher the pressure. And as that pressure builds, air starts pushing into the rest of the thorax, compressing the other lung, squeezing the heart, and causing the mediastinum to shift. This is a medical emergency. So if you suspect a patient have a tension pneumothorax, make sure to act quickly as possible to treat it. So, on that happy note, that's everything I wanted to cover about the pleural membranes. If you've made it this far, congratulations for sticking with it. Hope it's answered any questions you had about these membranes. But if you do have any other questions, please just get in touch. Other than that, thank you for watching, take care, and I'll hopefully see you again soon.